So I'm a journalist who doesn't write news, and I'm going to tell you the story of why. When I was 17, I went out with a young man called Tom Handel. He was tall, gently spoken. He loved Shakespeare. He rolled his own cigarettes. He'd stay up late, listening to Enrique Iglesias and teaching himself Spanish. And Tom was passionate about humanity. And even in his late teens, he was aware of hidden conflict in society around him, from fights outside bars on Friday nights to the emerging threat of a war in Iraq, and it preoccupied him. He wanted to step in between, raise his hand, blow the whistle. And it was this that propelled him towards photojournalism, to bear witness, to capture lives through a lens, and as the evasion of Iraq loomed, he decided to go there. He took his camera and went to record some of the lives affected by the conflict. It was a journey that would take him through the Middle East, first to Iraq, and then on to the refugee camps in Jordan, and then to Jerusalem, and then on to Gaza. He'd only been in Gaza a matter of days, when a group of children that he was photographing playing football came under fire. Most of them fled, but the youngest just froze, and Tom stepped in between. He'd taken the boy to safety and was going back for two little girls when he was shot in the head by a sniper. And so the storyteller became the story. And I remember walking down the road to the shop at the end of the road to buy the paper with his face on the front. Now his family fought for justice, and I felt I, felt I needed to understand the conflict that had caused his death. So alongside his sister, I took a job supporting medical assistance to the Palestinian communities. And after a military assault on Gaza in 2008, I had the chance to go there for the first time. I found the spot where Tom had fallen, and I just stood there. I looked around and I thought, how can we continue what he had started? How can I tell some of the untold realities of that war to the wider world? So we started making films. We would cart heavy camera equipment or across the Eretz border and then on through the checkpoints of the West Bank to the refugee camps in Lebanon. I started writing press articles alongside the films. And it was on a plane on the way back from Beirut that I wrote an article that got me shortlisted for an international journalism competition being run by The Guardian. And so I found myself on another plane a few weeks later, in fact, on my 27th birthday, going to Sierra Leone to report on disability for the finals. Now, I'd never been to West Africa before, so in the run-up to the trip, I just read everything I could but there were stories about their slave history, civil war, blood diamonds, amputations, malaria. So it was kind of a surprise to land in such a lush, green, laid-back nation. I spent a week there in a white Jeep with a press pass, driving around, and I'd interview disability rights activists who had logos on their T-shirt, whose eyes shone. In the evenings, I would write stories about inspiration and hope. And then, halfway through that trip, in an abandoned yard in Freetown, I met a young man called Fenge. Disabled by polio during the Civil War, his legs were knotted beneath his body. He was the nominated leader of a group of young boys and girls with disabilities who lived in that yard and got by doing what they could. Now, Fenge didn't have crutches. He pulled himself along with his fists. And as he came towards me, standing there in his yard, with my expensive camera, my Jeep, my smile, he was furious. He was ranting at me, 
angry at my presence, angry at my intrusion. And I was shocked. I remember stepping back and offering to leave. But he made me come back and he made me crouch and he made me listen. He told me just how frustrating and painful his life actually was. But he also told me how they got by without any help. How it was them that looked after those that were forgotten in the city. And then he pointed his finger at my chest and he said, go and tell them. And I remember looking down at his outstretched arm and seeing on his wrist a tattoo with the name of my local football team, Arsenal. So I came home, came home and I did what he asked. It was his story that opened my article, that won the competition. And as I stood there on the award light, I looked out over the crowd at their smiles, at them drinking champagne. I felt proud and I also felt uncomfortable. There I was, a celebrated storyteller, but it wasn't my story. It was my name on the byline, but not my life and not my struggle. I had cut and pasted and merged the bits that fitted, and I just left out the bits that didn't. And somewhere that same evening, Fenge was going about his life completely unaware of the applause in the room. So in the year that followed, the first year of my journalism career, I sat at home on a desk and I wrote on behalf of survivors, of gender violence, of conflict and dictatorship. I mean, life experiences that I could barely fathom but tried my best to depict. And then I traveled, restless, trying to get closer to the stories. But as an outsider, I was just skimming my hand over the surface. And then one day, I went to interview the veteran journalist, John Snow. And we were talking about the rise of social media, how exciting it was that the Arab Spring was being reported on by citizens. And then he said to me, you know, we are so much better connected, but there are these black holes. He said, I don't know any, of any Tuaregs who are tweeting at the moment. And I couldn't stop thinking about those black holes because they are easy to ignore. When attached to busy devices, you can just forget that over half the world is offline and that we're so excited about the rise of mobile phones but so many communities just lack the basic electricity to credit to charge them and the money to credit them. And then there are the scores of those who lack the literacy and the language to join the online conversation. And that, that is most acute for the half a billion women worldwide who are still illiterate. And even here in the West, where data and electricity flow far more readily, the population of over 80s is soaring brings with it such isolating conditions, vision impairments, cognitive impairments, that just make that group retreat from public dialogue. And beyond the digital divides, we have the social divides, and they run far deeper. There are the people that society sees as less, less interesting, less important, less valuable. And so their voices just retreat into silence. As a development worker, and then as a journalist, I had been passionate about untold stories, about the right to be heard. I've been excited about the media, about its potential to be a voice for the voiceless. I, like Tom, had wanted to find the stories that deserve to be shared and bring them to light. But in focusing on the right to be heard, I had actually overlooked the far more exciting aspect that those on the margins, beyond the divides, these are the world's invisible experts. They live on the front lines of humanity's most complex issues, from the quiet catastrophes of illness and poverty, to the global crises of epidemics, disasters, conflicts. Their knowledge, their experience is completely unique, it's deep, and it is critical if we are to understand the challenges of our time. 
And not only is their insight untapped, but the raw power of their own voices, their own words, is just diluted when we, the outsiders, speak on their behalf. And it was on the way back, on the bus from that interview with Jon Snow, that I found myself thinking, instead of being a voice for the voiceless, what if we, the next generation of young journalists, could focus instead on lowering the barriers for them to speak for themselves? So I decided to go back to Sierra Leone. I went and I found those that I had interviewed for that article and asked them, do you want to train as reporters? I had black and white photocopies of my journalism textbooks and I spent strange hours with them sketching out the concepts of social media with chalk on blackboards. Without internet, they had to share news using basic phones. That meant sending news stories in fragments via SMS, filing longer interviews using voicemail. They learned to be discerning, they learned to verify, but critically, they got the confidence to walk among their own communities and ask their own questions. And these skills, brand new, were put to the test just a month later during their national elections. I was back home by this point, but I still remember being woken up by that first text report, fumbling for my phone, looking at it, and it just said, it's 3 a.m., the streets are still dark, but people are starting to gather. I just remember feeling this thrill sitting up, turning on my bedroom lights, and so beginning what would be five days of rolling mobile coverage. They would speak to first-time voters. They would speak to mothers nursing their babies in the voting lines. They would flag missing ballot papers. And then one man just held out his phone to record the jubilant street scenes as the results were announced. Back home, in around a kitchen table in East London, we just received the reports. We posted them on Twitter. We made calls to media agencies, and it worked. Their reports were picked up by the BBC. They flagged malpractice to the EU, and that unknown offline network of street reporters was dubbed the Digital Election Trackers by Al Jazeera. And you know, it was incidental that most of them were disabled. So that early experiment launched our organization on our radar which today is a dedicated communications agency for the unheard. We use journalism, technology, research and design to look at the root causes of voicelessness, and we work with communities to find creative solutions to overcome it. Now, like whether we're in Sierra Leone, Ghana, India, we find that there are these common challenges for communities to communicate. A lack of connectivity, of capacity, of confidence. And then there are those who've been ignored so often that they've just lost the conviction that their voices matter. So we just tackle those challenges head on. We work with services and NGOs to reach communities in the margins. We offer them basic communication training in whatever format, wherever they feel most comfortable. So we have trained in care homes, under trees, in homelessness shelters, in libraries and in living rooms. We've built our own software that turns any phone into a broadcasting tool so they can report when it matters to them, when they need us the most. So we don't speak for the voiceless. They speak for themselves. We stay home, we build websites for their words. We broker agreements for fees and send them their earnings via mobile money. When needed, we coach them we train them as trainers. But critically, we just break the distance between us and them. We build relationships. We know if they're single parents. We celebrate when they give birth. We know whether they're struggling with recurrent malaria or even what football teams they support. And in the quiet times, they ask us about our families, our lives. We get holiday greetings. But then there are the times when the silence, the quiet, is chattered. May 2015. Our Sierra Leonean line lights up again. News of confusion, rumors, and then illness on the border. 
the Ebola outbreak had hit Sierra Leone. And overnight, our network became crisis reporters. Their mobile coverage was from a country under lockdown, whole com communities quarantined, and then separated from one another as human contact was limited. Their coverage shone a completely different light on the epidemic. One that was full of rich human stories that the media probably wouldn't have been able to reach by plane. The love stories. The husband who brought a plate of food to his wife three times a day, who was riding out the illness on her own in the bush to stop him from getting infected. The college couple who met on day one of the outbreak and had to wait a whole year for their first kiss. Now, their journalism was collective, unique, insightful, and it was award-winning. Closer to home, at the same time, we were setting up a network that was facing a completely different type of isolation and lockdown. We were training a group of people with early stage dementia to share chronicles of their life with a condition. Now, technology can become very difficult for those with dementia. It can force them to retreat behind carers, behind services, their voices diminishing as the condition progresses. So we designed them a really basic 3D printed mobile phone with one button, one word that just said report. Now pressing this would connect them to a voicemail that they could leave an audio diary any time of day or night. And our team would pick it up, listen to it, transcribe it, and upload it onto a collective blog called The Dementia Diaries. Now, no one knew if this was going to work or not. But you know, in the first 18 months, that network shared over 3,000 audio diary entries from their bedrooms and kitchens, from their bus stops and gyms. And you know, some are really hard to listen to, but others will make you laugh, laugh out loud. And all of them stop and make you think. I mean, I'd never even considered the thorny aspect of sexual consent for someone with dementia until one brave participant raised it. And it is a matter of pride for me that that network continues to thrive and grow, managed now by its own community. And this year, on the completely other end of the spectrum, we're working on a child-led media feature on life with malaria, an illness that hits the under fives the hardest. There are so many exciting tools right now for sharing information. We've got interactive platforms, virtual reality. I mean, it promises to shrink the space between us and forge connections and empathy. And you know, the conversation online, it is growing. There are now many Tuaregs on Twitter. More and more people joining that conversation every day. But there are and there will remain these vast black holes where voices are controlled, repressed, mocked, and denied. But this, this is about more than the media. This is about power and privilege, which lurk in every society, in every sector. It is about why the heard and the unheard fits far too neatly against the haves and the have-nots. <coughs> Now, the media does need to rebuild trust with its audiences. What better way to do that than to diversify its voices, democratize its channels, give over its own platforms to those living inside the news stories? But beyond the media, in every sector, we need to inject the same energy into voice and inclusion as we do into ending poverty into promoting democracy and calling for equality. Because you know that poverty is caused by voicelessness. Tyranny feeds off it. And inequality? Inequality is voicelessness. And if we just went the extra distance needed to really listen to those on the margins, I think we may find, find that we had the answers to those great challenges all along. Thank you.